let's get going. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, I see we have some people in the in the uh, in the Zoom room, and we have some people on Facebook. Uh, if you want to just put your put your name, where you're from, and your book title in the uh, the chat, we can get started. If you have any questions, um, you know, this is really casual today. Doing you know question and answer. We have Torin Brin here. She's the author of Fame Revolution. She's also a publisher, and um, Torin, I'll just give it over to you really quick. Do a quick introduction. Yes, thank you for coming. We're so excited uh, to bring your book to life and discuss how we can help you. Uh, so please uh, give your questions. We are here to serve you uh, in this hour. We really want to bring more books to life because we believe it makes a better world when great ideas are in a book form and you can read. Oh, you're from Columbus. My name is Taylor Richardson. Well, welcome. I'm working on a book. It's about a nonverbal learning disability. Oh, that's fantastic. Very exciting for you. And then we have Pam on Facebook. Where are you from? You're from New York. Well, hi, Pam. Thank you so much. You're writing about teaching. Okay, that's good. All right. We have some others of you. Uh, please just chime in. Um, so what we're going to get right at it. Um, so I am the publisher of St. John's Press, where great thoughts and tales come to life. We really believe that uh, creating those important. Uh, oh, there's John. Where's John from, Zachary? I can't see it on Facebook. Um, Richmond, Virginia. Okay, well, John, what are you writing? John says he is writing a nonfiction. And it is on his business. He has a, a small business, does it marketing? Okay, great. All right. So we have different expertise and we're really glad we didn't preface that we're much more an experts on nonfiction. And that's really what we want to talk about because it's really bringing the great ideas that are on your heart into, uh, into the world. Uh, so I'm going to, and then right here we have Zachary, who is the creative director, and he has helped design a lot of the book covers we've gotten great accolades from, and uh, is the one that it manages the process to make sure our book is published. So we have from A to Z, and so we've got some questions right now, and if you have any questions, just chime in the chat on Facebook and on Zoom. We're here to serve, and I think we'll just get at it, Zachary, because you do have some questions. Oh uh, yeah, we do have a couple questions, but um, I was wondering, uh, Taylor, uh, what kind of questions do you have today? I have a couple other questions, to do, but I have you right here. Uh, did you have any questions? I think it's really interesting nonverbal learning disability book. You know, nonverbal learning disability. That's interesting. Yeah, and then we have oh. teaching. I mean, what is, what is it about teaching, Pam? Uh, what is it that you wanted? So, um, yeah. But uh, we'll help each of you because you guys have different topics. You've got marketing, we've got uh, communications, business. So yeah, so why don't we, Zachary, why don't we just get to the questions? Okay, um, let's see. First we have, don't just get this. Um, not a good writer, but I have a lot of to talk about. So how do I, how do I develop that? What'd you say? How many, what did it say? It I says, didn't... I'm not a good, not a very good writer, okay. but I have some, I have great ideas and how do I develop that in my book? Well, so how do you develop with a, with an idea? Well, it's kind of like Taylor, you have a very interesting, it's a rare disability, which I haven't read and I'm very much interested in uh, things. And then with teaching Pam, um, not sure you haven't given any more details, but anything in teaching, if there's a specific uh, genre within teaching, I think would be good. And then we had John from New York. And so what's really key is we downplay our expertise and our expertise is unique. And so what people, there's almost like two kinds of ways of writing a book, right? You can have a great idea and you have someone help birth the idea from you, but you cannot have a process where someone takes your idea before it's come out of you. And it's almost like a butterfly. When you start writing, you're like a caterpillar. Um, you, it's a caterpillar where you don't like when they say, if we, if you touch the butterfly before it's ready to fly, you can destroy the wings. So like when you're a kid, you really want to touch that little caterpillar. You want to do something with it, but you shouldn't do anything with it because if you do, you ruin the wings. 
And that's really the process. You have to honor the idea. Before you are a writer, you are a creator of an idea. You are a creator of something. So like, uh, for instance, you, Pam, you want to talk about teaching. Oh, it was first grade teaching. Okay. So you want to talk about first grade teaching, how to be a better teacher, right? And John, what was the specific, what John wanted in New York? Uh, well, John, we didn't talk about John was just trying to figure out how do you write a book? Well, you have a full Okay. Job. All right. Okay. So, so anyways, and then we have you, Taylor, uh, wanting to talk about the rare disability, right? So what, what, what we really want to do is we want to honor the idea before we go into the writing process. And so what we believe is you take a period of time where you get the first draft, all the stuff that's in your mind out onto paper. And that is really the magic. And that is something you as writers cannot outsource. And we'll talk a little bit later about AI, but that's a process that is so precious because you are the cultivator of that idea. And in the process of being a caterpillar, becoming a butterfly, and we almost say that becoming a butterfly, there's many phases of being a, becoming a caterpillar, but in that first phase, you want to codify bullet points, you can record it, but it's getting your ideas out on into the world and onto paper. Awesome. Uh, so Torin, uh Taylor is saying that he uh, they, has a question on how do you format a book and says, I'm in the beginning stages of my book idea. So writing the first chapter has uh, the first chapter has already been written. Oh, great. So uh, what we recommend is have you thought of your audience? It's almost like creating a business plan. Have you created the book plan? Uh, what we recommend is almost do a PowerPoint presentation before you actually do the book. So like for you, Taylor, what I would do is think about doing a PowerPoint presentation for your friends or for some people that might be a target and then um, present that. What that does is you get to see, does the idea work? Because this is what we're saying is you are an idea creator before you are a writer. And so what you want to do is you, it's not, and, and it's very symbiotic. Like sometimes it goes, it gets messy after a while because sometimes your ideas come, then you backtrack, you go back and forth, back and forth. But I believe we honor so much the writing instead of honoring the creative process. And so what I would recommend you do, if, if a PowerPoint is not, if a PowerPoint is not the way to do it for you, you're going to want to honor the idea like so say for instance you taylor with the rare disability of the non-learning of uh, the non-verbal learning disability right so what you want to think about is you want to think about you're going to a conference and i have a client of mine that we're doing this so what he did was he went on several conferences he's writing a book on belonging and what we found was after three of these presentations, one of them just hit out the park. People were going bonkers over the thing. They loved it. He was he had a standing ovation. And we knew that's where the book needed to go, right? And so what what he did was he presented outwardly in conferences. You don't have to do that. You can you can do it with friends. But what happened was his speech almost becomes the book because it just hit all the points. And then now we're just adding points. And it's made his writing process a lot easier. So what I recommend is first think about your audience, almost like a conference, a speech that you're going to do. Think about the people you're going to present. It's always good just to think about one person. So we try to create a persona, create that person. And then what you're going to do is to do that PowerPoint presentation. And in the PowerPoint presentation, and then afterwards, and sometimes before, we think about what kind of writer are you? We do like a Myers-Briggs test as a writer. So what you can expect, what's the strength and weaknesses of you as a writer so that you know how to manage the process? Because writing a book is like being in a marathon. So that's, I hope that answers your question. So what I would do is number one, I would do a PowerPoint presentation. And before you do any presentation, you're always thinking about your audience. Um, think about imagery. So what's great about being in the creative process, it's not just about the words. We're, we're different types of writers. We have the writer that does all of its writing by recording it on a phone and seeing it in text format, right? You got other people that are writing in bullet points. You have other people that are using bullet points and imagery, right? So that's why I, I'm a PowerPoint 
I love PowerPoint. Zachary's not as much a PowerPoint. He's a Canva guy. But at the same time, we're think, but he loves mind mapping. So what he does is he mind maps his whole stories, right? So it's really using what modality works for you in being the creator and not the writer. And that's what I would start with first. Then the next thing I would do with, with your chapter, have you thought, and that's what, what what's so great about doing that PowerPoint presentation is that's when your outline starts coming to life. And we are very stringent about our outlines in the publishing. We try to create a high level story through the outline. So, and that's great. You've created the outline. It's wonderful. And then follow the outline and go through. And then what you're going to want to do next is, you want to vomit draft it. And you don't have to start sequentially with the first chapter. You can start where maybe, um, wow, I want to start with chapter three, right? Which is maybe about parents and the rare disability. I'm just coming with some ideas. Or with you teaching, Pam, like first graders, you know, first graders, first response to a teacher. I'm not sure what, what the topic is, but if that, if that makes sense. So um, that's how I would do it. And really the vomit draft, you just have to blurt it out. And that's one of the biggest mistakes we all do as new writers. Like I have been behind the scenes editing and publishing books for almost 20 years. But really when I started writing my own book, I made the same mistake. And this is why we believe in accountability group, helping you get on target. And this is where Zachary was a really good accountable person to me. He goes, no, don't do that. Get this out of your mind. And then we can start for the next phase. Um. Yeah, we have somebody asking if you could actually clarify what the vomit draft means. There okay. we <laughs> So what is the vomit draft? The vomit draft is the draft where you take everything that's in your mind and you just get it out. And this is where a lot of your research process comes to. So this is why I think of thinking of yourself as a creator first and then as a writer. In the creative process, you're going to want to do research. You're going to want, and you're still going to do research while you're writing. But in this beginning phase, you want to get everything that's in your mind out onto paper. And as much of the research as possible, you're going to want to get that out. And that's very, very helpful. And what happens is, at least for me, it took me three years to write my book. But when I was looking back, the same stuff, I felt like I was the Israelites 40 years in the desert or just going on Groundhog Day, repeating and repeating, repeating. Because a lot of the same concepts were exactly the same. I was just dressing it differently. So, uh, and I was making the mistake and it wasn't really until I got Zachary to help me. I had another person, Lisa, help me. When I created my own little accountability group where I could then move away from being Groundhog Day, repeating and repeating, repeating, just phrasing it differently, editing my sentences and just get it all down. And when I got it all down, it was much easier to go back and edit. Hmm. All right. Any other questions? Well, let me see one second. Uh, Richard is saying he has three different books that he started, okay. um, but he really isn't sure which one to actually focus on. He knows he wants to finish at least one of them. Um, but isn't sure which one. So um, what I would do, Richard, is when you look at the various books, which one has most of your personal stories? I think we are experts in our own lives. So I would say do the memoir style book first. Those are usually the easiest because you are your best expert on you, right? And that book in itself, will help you catapult the other books because it becomes an introduction to you. That is that is the one way to do it. The other one is if you've got a real academic book, you have all of the topics completely down, you can get that down. But what's, what people gravitate today, because I say that we're in the fame revolution, what does it mean to be in the fame revolution? Well, it means everyone has the potential to become known for what they do, to become that thought leader, that expert. And in being that expert, that is where you want to capitalize. But people want to know more than just your expertise. Haven't you noticed that? In social media, you got to share about your dog, what you eat. I'm going on a vacation. And then while you're on the vacation, you talk about your expertise, right? So today writing is very different than it was just four or five years ago. 
we as need to put a little bit of our more of ourselves into it. And that was the hardest part for me in my book. I had to, I'm so academic in what I do for me, I can help everyone else be better, but me helping me. No, I needed someone like Zachary. I need Lisa. I need a team to help me, but that's where you want to uh, put a little bit of yourself. That's why I recommend the first book really to be a memoir and your expertise on how showcasing it. Awesome. Uh, Richard says, thank you. Okay. Um, so Taylor over here on Zoom yeah. says, uh, this is my first time writing a book. I have a book company helping me write my book and a nonverbal learning disability about nonverbal disability. Uh, saying, what about publishing? Said, I'm getting help writing a memoir to my, about my stuff as well. That's great. So, um, we are, because we're in this fame revolution where everyone can become famous for what you do, gatekeepers are no longer as viable, which is what's very fascinating. You can make more money on a self-publishing book than a book that's published by a publisher, a traditional publisher. So what really comes down to is where, what do you want to do with a book? Uh, the recommendation is find a publisher that works with where you want to go. If you want to go with a traditional publisher, it takes a lot longer. It takes about two to three years to get your book published. You are not able to decide the title of your book. You're not able to decide the design of your book. That is their prerogative and you are at the mercy of them. You do get uh, sometimes money up front, but your royalties are between 10 to 20%. So that's a traditional publisher. If you want to go for a self-publishing, <clears throat> a lot of times that's all by yourself. You kind of feel lost. You get the book written and then you got to figure out how do I guide myself through the jungle? Um, we are a quasi publishing where we only take on books that we believe in, but we go in on it on a 50, 50 deal where we help the writer and the writer and together we create the book. The one thing that we've learned is that books don't necessarily make money. It's really about influence and it's in the influence and in the speaking engagements where you really get to capitalize on the book. So uh, with the publishing, uh, it depends which route you want to go. If you want to go self-publishing, if you want to go quasi like the hybrid publishing, or if you want to go for a full self-publishing. There are a lot of companies out there that can help you with the self-publishing process, which is what we also do. We help self-publishers self-publish their books, and we also help them in our, in our publishing models. So uh, what happens then is you decide what's nice about self-publishing and what's nice about the more quasi model is you get to decide what it is you want and the time frame you want to get it out. And it's really hinging upon you. Um, and the process really starts out with when you're done with the draft. And you're never really done with the draft. And that's the hardest part about writing a book. It's, I would say there's three phases. The two phases are really hard. First draft, getting it all out and really getting it all out and honoring the process of getting it all out. The second phase is when am I done with the book? And I think before you go into a uh, publishing, before you go into, um, I lost my train of thought, sorry about it. Before you go into the self-publishing realm, you're going to want to make sure it's completely added to where you want to have it. And then you can shop around. But what I would recommend, and this is what I forgot to say, was beta readers. I would have beta readers as soon as you can get them into your into your fold. Beta readers will help you capitalize and crystallize. Like I am so glad I had beta readers. I was a little late in the game with the beta reader, but the beta readers I had were of different generations. I'm Gen X. I had millennials. I had Gen Zers. And the Gen Z person demolished my book. Absolutely demolished it. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it hit a wall like this and it made me realize I have to go much more elementary, much more sequential. And, and now I'm getting really good reviews from all levels, all generations. So I would bring in the beta readers as soon as you can, if you're going to self-publish it. Then when you go into a publishing mode, you got to decide for yourself, when is the book edited and done? And it's never going to be done because when you're getting the proofs, there's always things that are going to tweak, but making those big changes. And that's only where you as the author will know. And if you have brought on an editor to be with you through the process. And then we have some people that were kind of chiming in on that, which is, you know, how do you do uh, 
all the legal processing, such as ISBN number and everything. Uh, I can answer that. So that's yes. the, uh, you know, getting an ISBN number is kind of a later in the game part of publishing your book. If you're doing a, a self-publishing or however you're going to go, the ISBN number really, that's kind of a, a later thing that comes in the, in the, uh, in the game. And they have services that you can get that from. Uh, you can get a barcode, yes. Um, there's ISBN services, which will offer that. Uh, and so that, you know, if you're going, depending on if you're publishing or self-publishing, um, you're able to access those via uh, ISBN services. Um, and then there's also things like um, the... Um, Library of Congress control number that you can get, which which helps your book as well. Uh, and then, you know, then on top of that, there, there are other things to consider. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, you know, where do you want to go with the book? So maybe, you know, are you going to need to uh, get a author website? Are you going to need, um, you know, do you have somebody that can hire that you can hire to do your book cover, do the formatting, interior formatting? And yes, those are things that come later. So those are, you know, it all comes together. You know, when you're writing a book, you have all those different things that you have to think about. You know, what's my book going to look like? Who's going to read it? Um, when am I going to find the time to write it? <laughs> all those different things uh, come up. Um, I think, Zachary, I'm going to read this question for you because I think this applies to you. How can you trust a book company and what are the things to look for and red flags that the company's not ripping you off? Mm -hmm. A publishing, um, a publishing company so let's see hmm, that's a good question how do you know if they're not ripping you off um it depends if they, are they doing it in a way where they're not hearing you they don't listen to what you want and they're suggesting saying this is the only path forward um for me that would be a red flag uh i would prefer somebody that gives me the flexibility um, so each person, you know, has to fit with what you're wanting. Um, but as far as like other red flags, um, I would say if they don't, hmm. I'm not sure what some other red, red flags. I think a lot of times what, what happens with, um, a red flags is really both have not got clear boundaries on what they want and what they do want. And I think what's really, really important for for you when you're looking for a self-publishing company is to know what you want. Uh, what gets really difficult, and we've had to learn this quite a bit, uh, where we've actually lost a lot of money because we want to honor our, our promise. But what we've seen is in the editing process and helping someone, uh, it gets to be, murky. It gets to be complicated, right? So you think like for us, that could be straight open and honest. We thought we had like a price on an editing and we saw that the quality of the book was not going to be there. And so we had promised this payment to our client and then we had to work the extra. And a lot of companies are not going to do that. So what happens is the editing process gets to be so murky. And a lot of times if companies promise the world to you in the beginning, and they don't honor that world to you, yep. that's that's a red flag. I know that we could have probably sounded red flaggish because we promised the world because we believe it, but we've actually honored our words and lost a lot of money on it, but we believe in honoring our word. So um, writing gets to be a complicated process. And I think as an author, you really need to take responsibility on it and at the same time people are going to help around you to say your quality is not good enough that is someone that is not a red flag if someone can actually tell you and be honest with you about your book is not good enough and will help you through it but sometimes in that process it gets to be so murky like with my book my book was supposed to be done in april right and we go through these dilemmas and and the dilemma was my, when I get my book demolished, your book's not good enough. And so what I love, there is this quote by Einstein and I hold on to that quote because I got it last year when I was in this quandary with my book. Do I just go for the publishing? Cause I promised everyone the quality is not as good. Do I just go for it? And 
at the right time, you get this quote, I get this quote in my life. And it's, it is Einstein saying, if you have an hour, you use 55 minutes to plan and five minutes to execute. And it hit me like a bomb ton of bricks, I had to redo it. Not only that, I had a client where I was basically ghostwriting the book and I saw the quality need to be here. He didn't really see it, but I know it needed to be there. I had promised an excellent product. We did it. And so what we have learned from this is that the red flags sometimes happen in good intentions. And then you're hit in the editing process and you don't know what to do. And so what we have learned from this now is that we're no longer ghostwriting us as a company. We are outsourcing and we are no longer promising on a flat fee. We are promising on a subscription basis because the world of editing takes a world on its own. My whole book, I had to redo the whole book in October. My book was supposed to be done in October. I sat October through Christmas, Thanksgiving, finishing it. And I'm so glad it happened. But sometimes that could seem like a red flag for someone. And I had to have this whole team supporting me. And if you're self-publishing, the meter ticks and the money ticks, right? And so this is this is the complicated factor of bringing an idea that's in your mind to paper because an idea is never complete until it's on paper. And I totally understand that now, now that I have my book, but in that phase there, as the writer, you need to take responsibility of it. And you are the full person to say at the end, making agreements. If someone gives a flat fee right now, I would say we were a red flag company. Last year we were red flag, but we promised it and we kept it. And our clients are really happy. I got really angry at myself for doing it, but I learned something from it. And what we do now is we do a subscription service. Well, we'll promise things, but we see a subscription is a better model. And the reason why is it honors both of us. It honors us as the editors and publishers believing your book can make it in certain time, but at the same time, honoring the writing process, honoring that process where things can go wrong or someone is giving you an argument you have to address and you need that extra chapter. And having promising this flat fee doesn't work. And I think if someone actually promises the flat fee, even though they have the best intentions and they might have a promise that they're actually going to do it, I would be hesitant towards that. I would go rather a subscription model. I would, and we've learned from it. I mean, we, because we honor our words and it was, it was tough, but I'm so proud that we did because the book is in great shape. It actually got launched at Harvard. Harvard ended up buying two cases of the book and that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't kept our promise. But what I would say, if you met us a year ago, we were a red flag publishing company. And, and, and I'm just being honest with you. And so we've learned from our lessons, but I think in publishing, we, we do things with the good intentions because we really, at least for me, I'm an idealist. I want these beautiful works to come out there. I hope that answered. And I, um, I think another aspect as I was thinking about what would be red flags is, and I think we kind of touched on it, um, two things is um, what, you know, if somebody is just like, oh, your book is perfect. It's wonderful. It's great. Let's just publish it. That's if they're not, if they're not honest about, about what the, um, the quality of your book. Uh, the other one is that- Can I interject with that one and then you hold your thought? Because yes. you are so right about that. That was one of the reasons why my book got delayed. I had a top level editor on both books, my book and this client's book, right? And they were not honest. They were taking the money and they were editing and it was not good enough. And by not being good enough, and when I finally got beta readers, that's why it's so important for you, all of you on this call, is to find beta readers that are honest honor the honesty, honor the brutal killing of your book. Because when people kill it enough, when you suddenly, when I remember when I was publishing my cover at this um, mastermind group and I got all these people pummeling it, but I knew it was good. Didn't matter who pummeled it anymore. I could defend my cover. I could defend my book. So what's really, really key is, is to um, find the honest beta readers. That is what's going to make or break your book. Awesome. And then we do have a couple other questions. Get another thought, Facebook, Zachary. Get another thought. But Thank I you. did have another thought, which is yeah. another red flag is if somebody tells you 
you're going to make a lot of money on your books. Uh, you know, if you, if you have a really endless marketing budget, yeah, you could, you could make a lot of book sales. However, books today are really more of authority pieces and they're to support, you know, your business support you as you're becoming a public figure, as you're building your personal brand or your business brand, that that's really the place that books have right now. Um, again, if you have a really big marketing budget, you know, you could bring in a lot more book sales, but um, if somebody's telling you you're going to make a lot of money and you're going to be able to retire off of your book, um, the likelihood of that happening is unfortunately much lower than perhaps it used to be. But I don't know. That's not what it really used to be. There's, there's an opportunity. And, and I've been studying this because I'm studying this with my own book. I don't know if you've heard of David Goggins. David Goggins wrote a book about his Navy SEAL career and it's a self-published book. And the reason why it went mainstream and sold millions of copies is it got into the hand of the right person, right? You can get lucky. You, he got on the Joe Rogan show. He got on the Joe Rogan show, which is the number one podcast in the world that catapulted his career, right? It's kind of like the Oprah effect. If you want an Oprah, things happen, right? So there are moments where that can happen, but the possibility of that is small. You can still work yourself towards it. I always believe shooting for the moon because then you make the stars. But I do believe where you're going to make money is in speaking engagements. Like my, like a colleague of mine, her name is Yamelka Rodriguez. She wrote her book and now she's on the speaking circuit and through the speaking circuit, she's getting all these clients, right? So there's a different strategy to making money, but to make sales, it's really your PhD of your expertise. Mm. That's what it's about. And um, I liked what Taylor was saying about he said he is an infj and um and yeah and i just put it in the chat that uh <laughs> having it really have you know understanding your personality and how you how you operate what you're all about really can go a long way as you're writing your book to put some of that into your book so that um so that uh you can really showcase that to uh to the world so, yeah, Taylor says, I'm it's a like Taylor Swift. <laughs> we got a Taylor Swift. We got someone that's writing a book on Taylor Swift. We're really excited. That's going to come out in May. So do we do we have any more questions or we want to quickly go through our presentation to give kind of an outline? What do you think? Um, there okay. are a whole lot of other questions on Facebook right now. They're not? Okay, so want me to, do you want me to go for the presentation? Um. Yes, uh, but uh, Taylor, did you have any other questions on your end um, as far as the book publishing? Do you feel like you got some value out of this? Really, again, as I stated before, we really wanted that to be kind of a casual question and answer time where you could you could ask some questions for a publisher, for an author, and be able to get some answers that would help you along your journey. Okay, great. So what we're going to do is we're just going to quickly go awesome. through for all of you that are on the call, just a little bit uh, a fast tracking. We just have a presentation. So just kind of create a synopsis of everything that we have done so far. So uh, Zach, if you let me share, you have disabled me from sharing. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You should be able to share now. Okay. All righty. Let's, uh, Okay. So this is just a quick recap of what we were talking about. And you'll get this PowerPoint um, afterwards. Um, so we're just saying, bring your books to life, reach the mountaintops of your dreams. What does it take to write a book? 90% uh, people fail. And that's what I was telling you earlier. 90% of people fail. The reason why, who was it that had three books? Was it Richard? Yes. So Richard, the reason why you're failing is because of this. And you know what it is? I already talked about it. It is you are editing yourself while writing the draft. This is why the vomit draft and getting it all out there is so important. So don't, this is why so many people have a book in their heart and they're not getting it out there. The next thing is you have an idea, dump your ideas. Another way to do is put stickies on the walls, categorize your ideas, mind map your ideas, and then I would recommend you present the ideas. But you're gonna to wanna to pick that one person and uh, I picked uh, a client of mine when I was writing my book and it really honed in on what it is I needed to learn. And then what helped was having my beta readers 
crystallize on how we could go beyond that one person. And that really was helpful. Uh, find the big idea and ask, what do I want them to understand? This really helped me get out of the weeds. You know how like you're riding, you're getting out into the weeds. This helps because you take a step back. Oh, I'm writing, 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 writing. Like for instance, you Taylor, you're writing your chapter one or you Richard, which books are you going to figure out which one you want? Which is the one you can really answer? What do I want them to understand? I don't know what it is about that angle, but it was like, what do I, it's instead of telling all these like side stories, I asked myself, what do I want someone to understand about the fame revolution, right? And so this is this is a powerful question that a lot of people don't talk about. So take note of this. I think this is one of the most important thing I can tell you through this book. Number one, don't edit yourself. Number two, always ask yourself, what do I want them to understand? The architect of the book is the PowerPoint presentation is the outline. The outline is so powerful important. And what's nice, and we have to have outlines today because we're no longer readers. We are scanners, right? You want to write your book for scanners as well as the reader. So like, for instance, with my book, I have basically told my whole book story into the outline. The outline is so clear. Like you write, uh, what is fame and why should it matter? You've got the power. You have the power. So does everyone else. What is the fame revolution? What, it, what? And then I just go down here and you can just read and pick and choose. So I would recommend you don't write a book that's chronological, but you write a book for the scanner. And that's why your outline is so important. Um, equipment to reach, find like-minded people. We actually really believe in our model, which is the accountability model we have where you meet twice a week, where we help you through the process from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. It's finding like-minded people and having that accountability. What we always say, what would be possible if people around you refused to let you fail? And we really believe in that because sometimes we get lost in the woods and we need someone to put us back into like a military thing. Boom, boom, boom. Like we have a bestseller mastermind now and we're going to be meeting next week. We took a break for Easter, but we're going to get back to it, right? Uh, and that accountability guidance. And what's important with accountability group is that you don't have this one guru. And I think that's another red flag um, is a guru that just says, this is my way or the highway. This is the way to do it. What we believe is in the true true mastermind part where everyone masterminds each other and becomes each other's beta readers. So you already have a, a group of beta readers, even though you're going to want to get other beta readers, but that'll help with the guidance, the brainstorm, support, and have some fun. Uh, and then I wanted to touch base on this because everyone talks about how AI can write your book. AI cannot write your book. And it's a danger for you as an author and creator of an idea to actually allow AI into your mind before you've gotten everything out of your mind. What you're going to want to do is in the first draft phase, when you are taking everything that's inside of you out onto paper, doing some research, you're going to want to not have AI into that. You don't want AI to infect it because AI does not have a soul and it makes a big difference. We can feel it. You can feel now when something is AI created. And so because there's a lack of creativity, lack of emotional intelligence, and what I say, there's a lack of soul. Yep. AI after the first draft is great. And what we do in our books is we actually, and this is something when you're writing, and this is another really good tidbit for you, is you're going to want to write in there how you used AI. So we're very particular about that because what we realized when we were testing this out was that Grammarly in AI detection software is detected as AI. So I'm a crisis expert. That's what I used to work in, crisis communications. So like I was thinking, what could happen if someone accused me of having written my book written by AI? So we tested through these softwares just to see what it was. And we find out because I've taken my book through Grammarly, because I'm not a grammar person, my book was detected 100% AI. That's horrible. And that's not even correct, right? And so what's interesting is it's great Grammarly is great for editing, but AI, you get you don't use AI in, in, the, in the beginning process. What's good with AI is it can help you with new words. It can help with research, and it can also help validate your idea. So what I did was when I was finished with my, my second draft, I then validated my ideas through chat because that's right when chat came. And I was asking, so what do you think about the fame revolution, fame economy? There was no concept out there, but it critically said, well, it can critically make sense. Then I went to, I, I've already gone to tons of people about it. So it wasn't just like AI, but it was kind of like, 
Nice to know, right? But it's a nice to know. It's not a must have. And I think that's really, really important. It can help with research, but you're going to want to create a secondary source because AI has proven to not be accurate. And it can kind of be an inspiration. You can have fun with it, a design information and so forth. So it, it has its tools, but it cannot be the originator of an idea. It's not an originator of an idea. It's a massage of your idea. And in the massage phase, when you're in the third and the fourth phase of your editing, that's where you can use like for Grammarly, for editing words, maybe finding a new word, doing some extra research. You just have a hunch. So you hunch it first in AI. AI gives you an opinion, then you hunch it somewhere else. And so what we have seen is that AI writes awkward phrases and overuses certain words. So what's fascinating is now Zachary and I can just intuitively find when someone's written on something from AI. We actually hired someone to write my, to write my, um, what do you call it? Someone to write my uh, bio. Uh, we hired someone on the outside and it was written by AI. And how did we see that it was written by AI? Journey, interesting interestingly in the realm of like we're right now creating an AI dictionary of all the trigger words that we know have come from AI. And this is a travesty because AI is changing the vernacular. It's changing the way we have to write because we cannot, we have to now have red flag words that AI use that we should not be using in our books. Uh, not only is writing good, but it's a testament to human creative. That's an AI thing. It's important to note one might consider it is worth mentioning. And that's just a few. I mean, Zachary, how many do you have now? 50? It's a massive list. <laughs> yes, it's a massive list, unfortunately. Uh, and so then we have uh, a big a big thing about design. And you'll get this. You'll kind of get an idea that you want endorsement reviews, author bio, front cover in here. But the interior formatting we recommend is InDesign. So we recommend that you actually invest in a good designer. Um, and, that, uh, and then you have a book cover. Uh, and you wait until you had the final decision of your book. So when your book is in the third phase, like when you're right about ready to publish it, that's when you start thinking about the book cover. We've made the mistake of when you think about the cover too early on, you can think about it too early on, but don't spend money on it until you're done with the book. And then test your cover with your target audience. This is huge. It really helps out getting back and forth. We got like great critiques from our, one of our books. I think it was this one. Zachary did a fantastic idea. This one here. We had like first like this woods. It's a climate book, right? It had all these woods and stuff like that. And then we just put this little line and this fit his personality, right? And the target audience loved it, but they hated the first version. So when someone really hates it, you take note of it. And then, uh, and then, What's the next thing? And so then we have a we have an invitation for people that want to come on. It's just an invitation. We do have a bestseller mastermind. We help people bring their books uh, uh, for 90 days. It's going to be April 17th. And then we also, um, and we help you bring your first draft to life. Um, and then we also have, if people want, we have a subscription model where you can then get, help you uh, with your book. And we help assess the book because what people don't think about is the complexity level of your book. If your book is complex, we have a five level complexity, like a memoir is a number one, it's the easiest one. Then you have, we have levels so that we find out where is the level of your book. The more your book is an originator of a new idea, the higher the level and the more intensity it's gonna require of you to work on it and getting people to edit it. Because the more the idea is fresh and new, the more you are on uncharted waters and being in uncharted waters is uncharted waters. So it has more risks involved, but it has a greater reward because you're creating a new category. You're creating a new idea. So kind of like you, Taylor, you're coming in with something new, which is exciting because that has a great potential for making you a leader in the field. And I think that was it. Was there anything else? Zachary, do we have any questions now? Um, we have um, Richard is wondering how we sign up for the um, accountability group. I think you have a link, don't you have a link that you can just share to them? Uh, we have yeah, a link. I can, I can put um, that in we, the chat um, one second. And yes. then, um, right. let's see. And then on Zoom, Taylor is asking about uh, how about self publishing and costs and things like that. 
Thank you. So that would really, I just put that in the chat as well. That would really depend on um, the complexity of the book. I would be more than happy to set up a discovery call, give some feedback and, uh, and maybe some extra tips along the way, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, the, um, the book, so we've had, we had a model student that did the book in, I think it was in a hundred and how long was, was it? Six months? Um, Less than uh, that. Which one? Four months. And Linda. Oh, yeah. So six months. No, it was, well, it just started in April. No, April, May, June, July, August. Five months. The book was out in five months. Uh, that was the fastest um, that we have had. Um, she had her book ready. We got the designs. And it could have probably done faster if she hadn't taken time off. Um, but it really depends on on the person getting on the time. But um, the major things is getting your book ready for editing, getting it as much ready. And when you're really ready with that, that can be done. I think we did Jackie in two months, less than yeah. that. Yeah, Jackie was two months, yep. Two months. So we published in two months, which was a level one book, really simple, really nice. We had, um, Linda's book was like a level three, which was five months. So it really depends upon... And how much the author is involved. Like we, when you're self-publishing, you're the boss and we honor you, but we'll be honest and help. But the process is, is what we um, work on it together. But we do discovery calls on that. So, and that's a subscription fee that we have uh, because we can't guarantee, we don't want to make those guarantees, but we will do our best within the process. And I just want to say, thank you so much for this time. Yes, thank you very much.